welcome to this episode of the weekly news roundup. The wave of drones and missiles that flew toward Israel on Sunday, April 14th, brought with it a new phase of tension, uncertainty and confrontation in the Middle East. Iran launched the unprecedented attack in response to a suspected Israeli strike on the Iranian consulate in Damascus, the capital of Syria, earlier this month. It marked a new chapter in a discord between the two states that percolated for years and has spiraled since Israel declared war on Hamas last October. More than 300 projectiles, including around 170 drones and over 120 ballistic missiles were fired toward Israel in the immense aerial attack overnight. Approximately 350 rockets were fired from Iran, Iraq, Yemen and Lebanon's Hezbollah, according to Israeli Defense Forces, the IDF. However, 99% of the projectiles were intercepted by Israel's aerial defense systems and its allies, according to the Israel military, with only a small number reaching Israeli territory. We have this report for you. Tehran's attack targeted the Navatim Air Base and Iranian Army officials said on Sunday, alleging that this is where Israel's early April strike on the Iranian consulate was launched from. Iranian ballistic missiles that reached Israel fell on the airbase in the south of the country and caused only light structural damage, Rear Admiral Daniel Hagari said. The base is functioning as continuing its operations following the attack, with planes continuing to use the base, Hagari added. Israel's war on Hamas, way since a militant group attacked Israel on October 7, has heightened those tensions. Iranian-backed forces in Iraq and Syria have launched attacks aimed at U.S. military positions in those countries and Iran's leadership has warned that attacks by its allies won't stop until Israel's war in Gaza ends. But fears of a spiraling regional war spiked further in early April when Iran accused Israel of bombing its diplomatic complex in Syria. That airstrike destroyed the consulate building in the capital Damascus, killing at least seven officials including Mohammad Reza Sahidi, a top commander in Iran's elite revolutionary guards. Iran's supreme leader Ayatollah Ali Khamenei said Israel would be punished for the attack, while President Ibrahim Raisi said it would not go unanswered. Israel believes that General Mohammad Reza Sahidi was one of the architects of the October 7th massacre in Israel. The Iran-backed Lebanese militant group Hezbollah said the strike would be met with punishment and revenge. The region has been on edge ever since with the U.S. and Israel warning of intelligence that an Iranian attack was imminent. Israel reacted angrily to the unprecedented strike while praising its military's response. An escalating diplomatic row and recent maritime run-ins between China and the Philippines, a U.S. treaty ally, have made the highly strategic South China Sea a potential flashpoint between Washington and Beijing. The issue will be a focus of trilateral meeting between US President Joe Biden, Philippines President Ferdinand Marcos Jr. and Japanese Prime Minister Fumio Kishida in Washington. Central to recent standoffs between the Philippines and China are two hotly contested features located inside Manila's 200 nautical mile exclusive economic zone but which Beijing claims as its own. China claims 90% of the South China Sea as its sovereign territory, but is opposed by Taiwan and five Southeast Asian countries. The waterway is strategically vital as it has rich fishing stocks, likely oil and natural gas deposits, and is also the place where three trillion US dollars worth of trade transits annually. The Permanent Court of Arbitration in The Hague ruled in 2016 that Beijing's expansive claims via its Nine Tash Line had no basis under international law, handing the Philippines a landmark victory, but that has not stopped China, which rejects the ruling from being more assertive. Beijing has deployed hundreds of Coast Guard vessels to patrol those areas, alarming the Philippines' rival claimants and other states operating in the South China Sea, including the United States which is very about China's growing military power and territorial ambition. Encounters between the Philippines and China in Asia's most contested waters have grown tenser and more frequent over the past year. As Beijing presses its claims, Manila refuses to cease its fishing and resupply activities to Filipinos at the two shores. 
China considers those to be illegal intrusions and has tried to repel the vessels. China's Coast Guard has stepped up so-called gray zone activities such as use of water cannon, collision and ramming tactics to try to stop the Philippine resupply and patrol missions. It has also deployed an armada of fishing boats the Philippines and allies consider militia. During the last two second Thomas Shoal resupply missions, Philippine boats sustained damage and some crew were injured after the use of water cannon. China's actions have drawn international condemnation and concern from major powers including the United States, Japan, Australia, France and Britain. President Ferdinand Marcos Jr. has adopted a tough line against what he sees as Chinese hostility and rejected its pressure, recently vowing to implement countermeasures against illegal, coercive, aggressive and dangerous attacks by China's Coast Guard, upping the ante in the escalating row. The United States has a mutual defense treaty with the Philippines and has repeatedly made clear it would protect its ally if its Coast Guard or armed forces came under attack anywhere in the South China Sea, calling the agreement ironclad. Meanwhile, Philippine officials, including Marcos, have dismissed talk of invoking the treaty in the present situation, stressing it would be a last resort. The Philippines separately summoned a senior Chinese diplomat in Manila to convey its protest and demand that Chinese ships immediately leave the waters around Second Thomas Shoal, which lies in the Philippines' exclusive economic zone, and for China to stop violating international law. Though the U.S. lays no claims to the busy seaway, a key global trade route, it has deployed Navy ships and fighter jets in what it calls freedom of navigation operations that have challenged China's claims to virtually the entire South China Sea. Beijing says the strengthening of U.S. alliances in Asia, including with the Philippines, is aimed at containing China and threatens regional stability. Aside from China and Philippines, Vietnam, Malaysia, Taiwan and Brunei also have overlapping claims in the resource-rich and busy waterway. Beijing has refused to recognize a 2016 international arbitration ruling that invalidated its expensive claims on historical grounds. The Russian city of Orenburg battled rising water levels after major rivers across Russia and Kazakhstan burst their banks in the worst flooding seen in the areas in nearly a century. The deluge of meltwater has forced over 1,20,000 people from their homes in Russia's Ural Mountains, Siberia and Kazakhstan as major rivers such as the Ural, which flows through Kazakhstan into the Caspian Sea, overwhelmed embankments. Authorities in Orenburg, near the border with Kazakhstan, announced a mass evacuation from there after water levels in the Ural River rose further, threatening the area with more flooding. Images from the city showed entire districts submerged in water. Nearly 12,000 houses have been flooded in the region bordering Kazakhstan as water levels in the Ural River keep rising and threatening more deluge. The floods part evacuations of thousands in the Orenburg region of Russia, located some 1,200 kilometers southeast of the Russian capital of Moscow, after the dam on the Ural River burst last week under the pressure of surging waters. Local authorities have declared a state of emergency in the region. The situation is most dire in the city of Orenburg, the administrative capital of the region where the water level in the Ural River reached a historical peak of 10.87 meters. A total of 7,800 people have been evacuated from the flooded area so far. The overall damage from the floods is estimated to exceed 40 billion rubles, about 428 million US dollars. Residents in the city of Orenburg said the waters of the Ural draw swiftly forcing them to flee with just their children, pets and a few belongings. Whole areas of the city were underwater and the Ural River rose swiftly to more than 35 feet, far above the level considered as safe by the local authorities. Further east along the Kazakhstan border, authorities in the regions of Kurgan and Tumen are also preparing for possible floods as water levels rise in the local rivers. Floods have also hit Kazakhstan, where authorities have declared a state of emergency in 10 out of 17 regions of the country, according to Russia's state news agency TASS. The state of emergency was still in place in eight regions, TASS reported. We see here an overhead view of the region last year on April 9, 2023, before the floods and then the same area on 11th April 2024 after the river breached its banks. 
we can see the vast areas that are completely inundated. Floodwaters are threatening a whole swath of northern Kazakhstan and many dams and reservoirs. There are fields to capacity. In news coming in from Gaza, three sons and at least two grandchildren of the Hamas leader Ismail Haniyeh have been killed in an Israeli airstrike in the Gaza Strip. The exiled political chief of the militant group has said from his base in the Qatari capital of Doha. Haniyeh said that his children Hazem, Amir and Muhammad and several of their children were visiting relatives for Eid at the Shati refugee camp in northern Gaza when their car was targeted in an Israeli airstrike. 60 of his relatives have been killed in the six-month-old war, he said, including 14 who died after an Israeli airstrike hit the family home in Gaza City last October. The Hamas leader said the attack would not change the group's demands for a permanent ceasefire and return of displaced Palestinians from their homes in ongoing negotiations mediated by Doha and Washington. Haniyeh said, all our people and all the families of Gaza have paid a heavy price in blood, and I am one of them. The Israeli military statement confirmed it had targeted Haniyeh's sons, who were described as three Hamas operatives who were on their way to carry out terrorist activities. We have this report for you. Hamas seized power after a brief civil war with the rival faction Fatah in 2007 leading Israel to blockade the territory, fighting four wars and dozens of smaller conflagrations before 7th October appended the status quo in the decades-old Israeli-Palestinian conflict. The war in Gaza has sparked fears of a regional conflict heightened last week by the killing of Jen Mohammad Reza Sahedi, a senior figure in Iran's Islamic Revolutionary Guards, in a strike on an Iranian diplomatic building in the Syrian capital of Damascus for which Tehran holds Israel responsible. Earlier on, Iran's Supreme Leader Ayatollah Ali Khamenei reiterated a promise to retaliate against Israel over the attack on its consulate in Damascus. Israel has attacked scores of Iranian-linked targets in Syria over the years with the apparent intent of disrupting arms transfers and other cooperation with Lebanon's Hezbollah, which is backed by Iran. Ismail Haniyeh's eldest son, Abdul Salam Haniyeh, confirmed in a Facebook post that his three brothers were killed. He wrote, Thanks to God who honored us by the martyrdom of my brothers, Hazem, Amir and Mohammed and their children. Appointed to Hamas's top job in 2017, Hania has moved between Turkey and Qatar's capital Doha, avoiding Israeli imposed travel restrictions in blockaded Gaza and enabling him to act as a negotiator in the latest ceasefire negotiations or communicate with Hamas's main ally Iran. Since the war in Gaza began six months ago, there have been nearly daily changes of fire between Israeli forces and Hezbollah along the Israel-Lebanon border. In the seventh month of the war, in which Israel's air and ground offensive has devastated Gaza, Hamas wants an end to Israeli military operations and withdrawal from the enclave, and permission for displaced Palestinians to return home. Israel regards the anti-Hamas leadership as terrorists accusing Haniyeh and other leaders of continuing to pull the strings of the Hamas terror organization. In latest news from the crisis in Manipur, the Kuki Zo people in Churachandpur, which was the epicenter of the earlier protests, and from Kangpokpi, took to the streets to protest after two village volunteers from the community were killed in firing near Kangpokpi district. This comes even as a Kuki student's body in the Delhi National Capital Region wrote to Prime Minister Narendra Modi and Home Minister Amit Shah, stating that Amit Shah's visit to Manipur was a must now and that Mr. Shah must promise the Kuki Zo people in writing to settle the conflict once and for all. We have this report for you. The violence came after a lull of over a month and days ahead of polls in the state, jolting the Kukiso community to take to the streets in both Kangpokpi and Churachandpur. 
Throughout last week, as political parties in the state found covered ways to campaign in the light of conflicts, voters in both constituencies expressed no enthusiasm towards the upcoming Lok Sabha elections on April 19th and 26th. The violence and the protests come amid reports that Home Minister Amit Shah was to visit Imphal for campaigning. Meanwhile, a group of Kuki Sir women, including journalists, social workers and leaders of Kuki Somi Hammer Women's Forums in Delhi, have written to the Chief Election Commissioner of India, Rajiv Kumar, informing him of their decision as representatives of the global Kuki Somi Hammer Women community to boycott the upcoming Lok Sabha elections. In their letter, the women said, with a heavy heart, we would like to inform you of the decision of the women in our community to exercise their constitutional and legal right to boycott the upcoming 2024 Lok Sabha elections. This decision does not come lightly, but as a culmination of their disillusionment and lack of trust in the current administrations, both at the national and state levels. In Churachanpur's Montbung area, Kukiso civil society organizations and Apex tribe bodies held a march. In their memorandums to the Prime Minister, Home Minister, President and the Leader of the Opposition, the KSO's Delhi NCR chapter said that the armed radical Methi outfits like the Arambai Tengol with assistance from valley-based insurgent groups and forces of Manipur police had attacked a Kukiso village near Kangpokpi on Saturday, leading to the killing and mutilation of the Kukiso village volunteers. The body appealed that the intended visit of Home Minister Shah was now a must and that the visit should sympathetically assure that the Kuki is in writing to settle once and for all the problems. And amidst a renewed violence in the state, the Churachanpur District Christians Goodwill Council issued a public appeal calling for everyone to pray for a peaceful conduct for the elections. It called the elections a time to reflect deeply on the critical issues confronting us. It is a time to stand firm and resolute not to be swayed by the lust for money and power. It added that the people should seek a candidate who best embodied the principles of religious tolerance and freedom of worship. In news coming in from Australia, a stabbing attack last Saturday afternoon at a crowded mall in Sydney left six people dead and at least 11 others injured, including a nine-month-old girl. The rampage was the deadliest act of mass violence in Australia since 2017. The authorities said that the attacker who was identified on Sunday as 40-year-old Joel Couchy was shot and killed by a police officer. The attack happened at Westfield Bondi Junction, a popular shopping centre about a mile away from the famous Bondi Beach in Sydney's affluent eastern suburbs. Witnesses described a chaotic scene as shoppers noticed people running and saying that someone in the mall had a knife. As the attacker moved through multiple levels of the mall, the police said he began to stab people. Five people died of their injuries at the scene and a woman died later in the hospital. The police said at least 11 others, including eight women, two men and a nine-month-old child were taken to hospitals. The New South Wales police said a motive for the attack was unclear but there was no indications that it was a hate crime or related to terrorism. The officer who shot the mall attacker has been praised as a hero for her actions, which authorities said undoubtedly saved more lives. Senior police inspector Amy Scott arrived on the scene first and was alone when she engaged the attacker. She shot him when he lunged at her with a knife, police said. By Monday morning, the identities of all six victims had been released by their families, employers, local communities or the authorities. Ashley Good, a 38-year-old new mother, was stabbed along with her 9-month-old daughter. After she and her baby were attacked by Kauchi, Ms. Good thrust her child into the arms of strangers. The Saviour's two brothers that were shopping that day described the terrifying situation, saying, The mom got stabbed and the mom came over with the baby and threw it at me, one man said. After being handed the child, the pair proceeded to pull the victims into a store and compress the injuries with clothes. The condition of Ashley's nine-month-old daughter, who was with her when they were both attacked during the Westfield Bondi Junction, stabbing rampage has improved from critical to serious, officials have revealed. The baby underwent surgery on Saturday night and was doing well, but Miss Ashley Good, her mother, who protected her, did not survive. 
Miss Good's family released a statement to the media expressing gratitude for the brothers' actions and described their late family member as a beautiful mother, daughter, sister, partner, friend, all-round outstanding human and so much more. 30-year-old Faraz Tahir was a security guard who arrived in Australia about a year ago from Pakistan. A spokesman for the Ahmadiyya Muslim community said that Saturday was Faraz's first day at work at the Bondi Junction shopping mall. Faraz, a Pakistani citizen, had fled religious persecution in his home country and sought refuge in Australia, coming to Sydney last year. Members of the Ahmadiyya Muslim community held a vigil outside Westfield Bondi Junction to pray and commemorate the innocent lives lost during Kauchi's rampage. Tahir worked a series of jobs before getting his security license. Jade Yang, 47, was a mother of two daughters and an active member of the nearby Bronte Self Life Saving Club. According to her LinkedIn profile, she worked as an architect. 25-year-old Dawn Singleton was the daughter of millionaire advertising guru John Singleton and worked for Void Fox Boutique, an online fashion retailer. Pikriya Dashia was a 55-year-old artist and designer. She was originally from Tbilisi in Georgia and, according to her LinkedIn profile, was an artist and designer who studied business administration at Sydney Taffy, which is Australia's largest vocational education and training provider based in New South Wales. Yixuan Cheng, a Chinese citizen, was a student at the University of Sydney. It's understood she was doing a master's degree in economics at the university. The day of the attack, Cheng had finished exams and went to the mall to try on clothes. 17 people were hurt in the attack, of which 14 were women. The attacker, 40-year-old Joel Kauchi, was shot dead by police in the mall after he lunged at an officer with his knife. Thank you so much for watching. Until we meet next time, stay blessed.